Welcome to SDG's Promise Japan's first seminar series, Global Health in the Age of COVID-19, Infectious Disease and Human Security. My name is Yuma Ishii, and I'm an MD-PhD candidate at the Tokyo Medical and Dental University. I am also an associate at SDG's Promise Japan, and I will be your MC today. We have an exciting discussion today, and I'd like to ask Ms. Suzuki to start us off with her opening remarks. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, President Bradley and President Kitaoka, for joining us today. Over the past decade, SDGs Promise Japan had worked across reducing poverty and ensuring human security. In this new COVID-19 era, a strong response for global health and health system strengthening is necessary to achieve SDGs and peace and prosperity worldwide. Through this online seminar, we invite multidisciplinary experts such as President Bradley and President Kitaoka to share their insight on these topics as well as their advice on how we can live with COVID-19. Thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you will enjoy this seminar. Thank you, Ms. Suzuki. Without further ado, please let me introduce our speakers for our first seminar. Prior to becoming the 11th president of Vassar College, President Bradley was the director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy at Yale as well as the head of Branford College. She is also the founder and former faculty director of the Yale Global Health Leadership Institute, which operates education and research programs in China, the United Kingdom, Ethiopia, Ghana, Liberia, Rwanda, and South Africa, through which President Bradley directed projects to improve and enhance Ethiopia's healthcare system hospital management, and availability of primary care. Before assuming his current post as president of JICA, President Kitaoka was president of the Uni International University of Japan. His career includes being the professor of National Graduate Institute of, for Policy Studies, the professor of graduate schools for law and politics at the University of Tokyo, where he is now an emeritus professor and the deputy permanent representative of Japan to the United Nations. He has served as deputy chairman of the Council on Security and Defense Capabilities and chairman of the Council on the Development of Long-Term Strategy as a growth strategy based on the Paris Agreement. Over the years, he has received many honors and awards, including the Medal with Purple Ribbon for his academic achievements, and has written numerous books and articles on modern Japanese politics and diplomacy. Today, we will learn about their careers in the fields of national security and global health, their insight and advice on diplomacy and pandemic preparedness, and what they believe is necessary to rear next generation leaders in the era of COVID-19. Welcome again, President Bradley and President Kitaoka. Thank you for joining us today. Perhaps we can kick this discussion off with President Bradley, looking back on your career, how you've been involved in international cooperation and what your role is in this field today. First, let me begin by thanking um, our wonderful hosts um, Dr. Kataoka, I am very honored to be here with you. Thank you so much. And I am uh, very admiring of all that you've accomplished in your career. And Ms. Suzuki, this initiative through the SPJ is so important. Even as it is starting small, it is already doing wonderful things. So I very much appreciate being here with you. Uh, and Yuma, so nice to see you again, having met a year ago, and thanks for putting this whole thing together. So I appreciate it. 
Um, you asked me about looking back at my career, um, how has it really involved international cooperation and how does that help us in the area of global health and security? I, I would probably start with um, a couple of really key insights I feel that I've gleaned after 30 years of this kind of a career, and I'll be very interested to hear Dr. Kotelka's views on this as well. Um, but first, much of my work has been involved with either uh, international agencies like the World Health Organization or the World Bank, or has been directly in a country with the Ministry of Health, often um, related to programming that was really designed inside the country, not internationally cooperative, but inside the country. And I think I've learned a lot from those two interactions. One, when one works at the global level with international um, agencies that are multilateral, um, like the WHO or the World Bank, the potential for transformational change is enormous. But we so often fall short of that transformational potential, largely because the underlying trust of countries making up that multinational agency is not strong. Often there is trust between a bilateral agreement, but less trust multilaterally. And this for me is one of my great sadnesses actually over a 30 year career of um, where we sit right now. And particularly the United States is in a very tough spot in terms of its really support for multilateral agencies, a spot that I think many public health people are not supportive of, that we really should be more engaged and um, more collaborative in that multinational space. The second domain that I've worked a lot in is with countries themselves. So you mentioned Ethiopia, I've done this in Ghana, um, I worked um, uh, in Rwanda, we're still working there in ways in which the government itself has got a strategic plan, they have a political platform, they, they know what they want to achieve and are ready to lead, but often have needed technical support. And I know Japan gives much of this in many of its um, efforts overseas as well. Yale and um, Vassar have both done a lot of this work and that has been extremely gratifying to work with. When I was in Ethiopia, I worked with Dr. Tedros, who is now the head of the WHO, and I worked with him very closely for a decade. And he had tremendous leadership and political savvy. What he needed was ideas from the outside and technical support. And in that way, I think the United States and our work has been very, very successful. And I feel very proud of that work. Um, and and it's, it stands in contrast to the work um, done, I think, in a multilateral environment, which I hope will shift over time. I might just end um, the, this brief part of this with bringing us up to date now at Vassar, which is a liberal arts college in the United, in New York. Um, it has undergraduate students. Um, we do have multiple um, international collaborations. One of our strongest is with Rwanda, where we work at the University of Global Health Equity to teach students there and they are, you know, right out of high school, just starting medical education. We teach them liberal arts, like history, writing, critical thinking, research. And that's a very exciting collaboration between Vassar and the University of Global Health Equity. We also have a nice collaboration with Achanamizu in Japan, where I visited this year, uh, which is just a wonderful college um, and university to work with. And um, we that has been going on nearly a decade now. And we send students there, they send students to Vassar, and it's really a, you talked about diplomacy, it's really a moment where students aren't just studying global health, but they're studying everything, all kinds of things. And, what they're really learning is empathy and understanding and um, diplomacy between the countries, which I think is at the heart of trust and is at the heart of making our multilateral 
efforts more effective in the world. So thank you. Thank you, President Bradley. Um, President Kitaoka, uh, may we ask for your perspective and experiences? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and then, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm very happy uh, to discuss uh, uh, this very interesting topic with uh, President of Basta College. Because, you know, I'm originally a historian, and I know something about uh, Meiji history. And then when Japan started the real modernization effort in uh, 1868, within only three years, Japan sent a big delegation to the United States and to Europe. Uh, to learn what is the real modern Western civilization was. And then they brought uh, several very young girls, and one of them was accepted in Vassar College. And <laughs> she was educated very effectively. And she came back to Japan and got married with a very famous uh, army general, and mm -hmm. who later on promoted to prince. That's why I hear uh, just from you that uh, she's uh, uh, called as princess in, yes. in your country. <laughs> We're very proud of her. <laughs> <laughs> About myself, uh, yeah, I, my real specialization has been the modern Japanese political and diplomatic history. Uh, but also, I also uh, began my uh, uh, research on the contemporary international politics. And in that capacity, I was asked to be in the uh, council to give advice to the prime ministers and foreign ministers, starting from 1992, so many years ago. So then I was very young. But since then, I have been in those kind of councils to uh, most of the foreign ministers and uh, prime ministers. And then in 2004, I was uh, asked to uh, go to the United Nations as an ambassador. And then I uh, just got into the uh, the world of diplomacy uh, from scholarship, from scholar to a, a practitioner. Then I found that uh, many of the scholars, many of those countries are still developing countries. And then uh, in order to give the, uh, the advice to them, the, my real background, modern Japanese experience is very useful and then I got very much interested in uh, the providing uh, my knowledge about my Japan's own experience of modernization to those people. And while I'm working on the uh, many issues on uh, peacekeeping or poverty reduction and so forth, we became very close to Jeffrey Sachs. And then uh, after coming back to Japan, I we established together with my wife here uh, mm -hmm. the, the small NGO. Uh, yeah. uh, this is how I came here. And then I, I again came back to the campus and after spending some years, and I was then asked to be the, uh, the uh, leader of uh, JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency. Uh, for those people who do not know much about uh, Japan's ODA or JICA, let me speak, uh, let me uh, use uh, a few minutes uh, to speak about uh, JICA. You know, Japan was the uh, biggest donor uh, in the 1990s. Now, uh, because of uh, economic stagnation, Japan is now number four after mm -hmm. US, UK, Germany, and, and together we are about the same level with uh, France. Uh, anyhow, the, well, Japan has been very serious in providing offshore development assistance uh, since 1950s. Before we became accepted in OECD. So it's very unusual to start ODA before becoming an OECD member. And then uh, uh, we, our focus was originally uh, Southeast Asia, and East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. And then the result is very clear. At that time, the, the Southeast Asian countries are very, still very poor, uh, roughly about the, as poor as a uh, uh, sub-Saharan countries. Now, now, as you know, the, they, are, they have developed quite a lot. Yes. And then uh, we, can, we can be proud of uh, our cooperation. Certainly, the development was uh, because of their hard working and their ideas and the government of the people. But at the same time, I'm sure that our cooperation could have uh, could contribute to some extent. And then this is how I became to be involved. Still, I think that uh, my background 
uh, the special of Japan's modernization is uh, very useful. And then uh, that's how uh, I'm involved and that's how uh, I'm uh, uh, leading my organization. Thank you for sharing your experiences, President Kitaoka. Now I'd like to ask uh, about your current positions. President Bradley, I learned that Vassar College will be reopening next month. Um, but how did you respond to COVID-19 and what challenges are you currently working on? Yes, well, thank you so much. This is uh, an issue that has taken hours and hours and hours of planning, collaboration, system redesign, educational classes redesign to really try to adapt. I guess I, I wanted to step back a little bit. When COVID first uh, became apparent in January, I really do believe that many public health people in the United States believed that because we had good pandemic preparedness over the last decades, like the way we responded to SARS, for instance, and the way we responded to Zika, really even the way we responded to Ebola, we had excellent systems in place. Our CDC, our FDA, what we call health and human services were collaborative, knew their stuff, experienced, supported by the administrative, um, uh, the executive branch of government. Um, I think because of that, we were lulled into a false sense of security, that we had the, what, what was needed. Then as February came around and March came around, it was clear that the virus was not really contained in any way and that the community spread was extensive and that we might still be okay if we could really ramp up testing very, very fast. And the United States has a lot of resources. That's not, not crazy to think we could have done that. However, I think that, again, our current situation in our government and our current sort of lack of preparedness, the, the emergency preparedness team, actually, which President Obama had put in place, had been dis disassembled early in this administration. Um, and then the experience level of the CDC, FDA, and HHS were more limited they weren't the same people etc and i think even at the local level um public health people were kind of waiting for federal advice and um activity to move on so we missed the opportunity i think to contain even after we knew there was community spread i think there was an opportunity for high scale testing today um, although the original sort of epidemic in the United States, pandemic in the United States, really hit exactly where we are. I mean, we are 45 minutes from the epicenter uh, in Westchester County uh, where the uh, pandemic hit worst in the United States. That was back in March and April. Today, the state I live in, New York, uh, very much has contained the virus. And in my county, which has 300,000 people, we test more than 1,000 people a day, and usually five to seven, 10 people are positive. I think yesterday only two were in the hospital. You know, it's very, very contained where we are. But as we all know, the United States is very large, geographically, population-wise, and incredibly diverse and fragmented. And as a result, in other parts of the country, um, many, many other states, pretty much everywhere except the Northeast Corridor, um, the pandemic is raging. And reproductive numbers very high, over 2.0. And um, it's really an extremely scary time. Um, so, what does Vassar College do in the midst of this? Because actually around us is quite contained, but we draw students from all over the world, Japan, of course, but all over the world and all over the country. Um, so we are, we have been planning for, uh, now it's been 12 weeks straight planning for a method by which we could have classes in person and also remote. 
This means that every student can select whether they want to live at home and take our classes on Zoom like we are now, or whether they want to come to campus and take classes in person. Our faculty are a blended faculty. Some will teach remotely and some will teach in person, depending on how they feel. That's their choice. And we expect that our employees, we've set up a nice telework program, so about probably half of our employees can work from home rather than from on campus. The things that we're working on very, very hard right now are um, twofold. One is as we bring students back, we want to be sure we limit influx. In other words, COVID coming from out there onto campus. That's job one. We have to limit that. So we are requiring every student to have a negative COVID test within seven days before they arrive. And then we're testing them in their very first days here. Our response time, you know, is supposed to be one or two days with that test response time once they're on campus and they'll be quarantined until that's negative. Um, and then we will um, have the campus as a whole. Students cannot leave the campus. It will be we want to be the New Zealand of higher education, <laughs> where you can create an island and you don't have very much back and forth. Our employees, of course, do come back and forth, but they many of them will telework and they will be masked. You have to have a mask on campus all the time and they will keep social distance. Almost every room on campus has now been assigned um, by how many people can be in that room and still be six feet apart. So as you walk into New England 105, you'll realize 15 people is the maximum here. And um, we also, of course, have done what I think so many countries have done to put up plexiglass barriers and things on the floor so you're orchestrating or choreographing where people can move. A lot of one-way movement now instead of back and forth more cleaning staff, um, a lot of cultural work. Uh, you heard me before talk about trust, and that's true inside a college too, not just between countries. So we're working very hard on community care standards. Um, everybody signs a pledge that they promise to uphold the standards, and we're developing a um, kind of community accountability. And I don't know, I'll be curious what you all think of this, but where all people in the college feel empowered to remind someone, hey, you forgot your mask or you're standing too close. And the person who is reminded is obligated to say, oh, thank you for reminding me. So that there's no um, kind of gotcha, but more we are as a community working on keeping each other healthy. I'll just end with, you know, we think every day about should we do this or should we go fully remote? And we still have the opportunity to go fully remote and we're in touch with our local public health officials daily on this question. But we also know that this virus is here to stay. And after this virus, there will be others. And that learning how to have human interaction in a safe way with universal precautions is critical. So, um, you know, we're still looking at the timing, but I think it's an opportunity for Americans in colleges like Vassar to learn interconnectedness, how we work with each other to uphold each other's health. And this is a value system that I think Americans can really benefit from. So I'm, I'm very excited in a sense of having 2000 young adults and that's what we're really learning because if they can take that value out to their future life heck maybe they'll get good at taking much more complicated problems on even the racism we face the social inequities we face you know all of that stems from a root of not understanding we're all in it together we are interdependent and um, I think we have a real opportunity to develop that capacity and I hope we'll do that. Thank you President Bradley. President Kitaoka with the size of JICA and the number of countries you operate in how has it been responding to COVID-19 and what are some next steps that JICA will take in combating this disease? 
Yes. And then also, let me start with the uh, state of Japan, uh, just to correspond to the, uh, the explanation of uh, President Bradley. Then, uh, frankly speaking, Japan's response to the COVID-19 was a little bit late uh, because uh, of the two reasons. One is that uh, Japan was uh, still uh, planning to, wishing to, to have the Olympic Games this year. So uh, that's why it was rather uh, late to decide uh, to take uh, uh, to the next steps. And then another reason was, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, when it comes to, we have a custom of having face masks and others, but the supply chain is very much de depending on China. You know, we could not get the, those uh, kind of uh, masks and uh, protective clothes because they are produced in China when where they are they need them very much. So at the very beginning there was some confusion in Japan, but Japanese government started uh, to appeal to the people uh, to be very attentive at the end of uh, March or early April. And then, but Japan's characteristics was that the Japanese government did not take strong measure. They just appealed to the people and to avoid uh, the meeting with the too many people or to take the distance with the other people and something like that. Uh, but still, it worked because the Japanese people, they paid their attention to, to other people and then they wanted to avoid to be the source of trouble to other people. Then uh, it calmed down uh, then toward uh, the mid-May and then the Japanese government uh, just started to open the society. And then again, there's another wave is coming now. Uh, but still, you know, the, uh, the total number of the newly infected people is, uh, uh, roughly speaking, 1,000 a day, uh, on which Japanese people are very much concerned. But still, the, the total number of the deaths until today is a total number, 1,000. You know, Japan's population is 40% of the United States. Still, 1,000, this is, a, a, we can safely say that this is very low in number. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, then let's next uh, go to the what we are doing as JICA in foreign countries. We have roughly uh, 100 offices overseas. Then, uh, but we have to uh, uh, withdraw many of them uh, because, you know, they are located in uh, countries where uh, the good hospital is not available. Uh, and also the transportation is very difficult. And that's why we withdraw many of them. In that sense, uh, JICA's assistance was also a little bit delayed. Uh, but we are starting new initiative right now. Uh, we have, uh, you know, long uh, tradition of assisting those people in this area of health and medicine. But our focus has been in prevention rather than curing. We believe that the prevention is more important and more effective. Uh, starting from, you know, providing clean water yeah. and then providing, uh, teaching the, the kids uh, how to wash, please wash your hands. Uh, for example, uh, JICA has uh, uh, built 200 elementary schools in Egypt uh, by the request of uh, Egyptian president and on the Japanese model. And then their custom starts with the washing their hands when they arrive at the school. And also they are requested to clean up their floor together by themselves. So this is how we introduce and then ask them to uh, have a custom of washing their hands to make the things clean around you. And also our uh, one thing we are uh, doing very much is uh, uh, providing mother-child health care book, which is a small book. In Japan, we provide this to the uh, woman when she is found as pregnant. Then she writes in uh, all the important records. When she found pregnant, uh, what kind of shots uh, uh, how heavy was a baby when he, was, he or she was born, and also what kind of shots were given to him or her. And then this is a very important uh, source included here. Uh, so this is also important. 
Also, the, uh, uh, we have been uh, supporting the agriculture and also the, uh, how to uh, teach them on nutrition. And then uh, well-balanced nutrition is very diff- important. You know, years ago, we tend to focus on how to prevent hunger. But uh, uh, providing food is not enough. Providing good food with new, good in- nutrition is important. So over and over, uh, our focus has been uh, on prevention. So uh, based on this tradition, we are providing and uh, uh, the, the, we are starting new initiative, which I might call, be able to call Global Initiative for uh, Health and uh, Medicine, uh, in which I, I am planning to do um, many kind of things together organize those kind of things and then the core should be building hospitals actually jica has established in the past uh, 30 40 hospitals in the world uh, the new one was in mongolia uh, which was completed last year uh, another uh, things were actually we have a long tradition the first one was uh, uh, by the japanese in foreign country was in taiwan when uh, the Taiwan was a colony of Japan. It was in 1890s, which was very effective. And also in also Thailand, in Manchuria, uh, when it was a part of Japan's colony, and which was also very effective. Well, of course, I'm against uh, colonialism, but still the, uh, there are some good policies even among colonialism. And then uh, based on this tradition, uh, we have, uh, say, uh, build a new, very good uh, uni- uh, uh, hospital in Beijing in 1984, which is still working, one of the leading hospitals in Beijing. And recently, we have established, as I said, in Mongolia, and we have been supporting the hospitals in uh, Vietnam. Uh, it was started when it was uh, South Vietnam, and then turned to the uh, <laughs> Vietnam, today's Vietnam, uh, still working uh, beyond the uh, the differences of the regime. Also, last year, uh, two years ago, I visited a, a, a hospital attached to the medical school of uh, Indonesia University, uh, which is also uh, uh, doing very well. So based on this experience, in Africa, we have some uh, a couple of good institutions like uh, 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 Noguchi Institute in Ghana, uh, the, uh, yeah. which is named after Noguchi Hideo, a uh, uh, very famous uh, medical scientist in the 1920s. And also in Kenya, we have a very good collaboration with the Kenyan government. So based on this tradition, we are trying to expand and also to cover other uh, uh, policies in preparation and others. Uh, and and I, I'm willing to call it uh, you know, global initiative. And I, I'd like to uh, uh, appeal to other democratic countries. Let's do this together to France. Uh, why don't you do this in Senegal uh, or Cote d'Ivoire or Morocco <laughs> and uh, things like that. So uh, uh, this is a, a new stage. So uh, the, we have to wait the, uh, for uh, the decision for the, gov- for the budget <laughs> from the government in uh, Probably this is be, to be decided in the end of this year. So uh, I, I'm just planning, uh, waiting for the, their favorable decision on this budget. Wow. May I comment on that for one moment? Of course. That is so exciting. I think your vision is tremendous. I've been to Noguchi. Actually, when uh, uh, Dr. Noguchi visited Ghana, it was in the 1920s. Uh, when I first visited Ghana and visited this institute, and I saw the pictures of that time, yeah. it, was, it, it was so poor. Yeah. There's nothing at all. Mm-hmm. And then it was just uh, uh, 10 years after Dr. Schweitzer. Yeah. In that sense, we have a long tradition of uh, uh, assisting the uh, people in yeah, you no, know, Noguchi is just wonderful. We did a lot of mental health research with the University of 
Ghana through the Noguchi Institute. And then um, I haven't been to Kenya, but the hospital focus is very interesting. That's really what Ethiopia did with Yale was and the Clinton Foundation and the Gates Foundation trying uh -huh. to build hospitals and, and really think about the inside of the hospital. How do you manage it? Not just the bricks and mortar, but how do you run a good hospital? So I, I congratulate you on a very exciting vision. <laughs> Well, one thing I can add is that we have a very unique uh, approach, which is a project for a clean hospital. You know, mm -hmm. the, right. in Africa, sometimes the hospitals are not very clean, exactly. which is very bad. <laughs> Therefore, we are trying to much effort to clean up the hospitals, which is relatively cheap, you know. <laughs> yes, it's a great blessing. And it's all about the systems, really, which Japan has innovated for decades and decades and decades. Nice. Thank you very much, President Bradley and President Kidaoka. Um, in these times, the U.S. and Japan, as developed nations, um, may be expected to support the rest of the world, but this may be a little bit more difficult than usual. What types of approaches and philosophies should we consider our nations, or maybe our nations consider, to promote international cooperation? Um, President Bradley, you mentioned interconnectedness and interdependentness, um, but they May we hear a little bit more on this topic? Yeah. Well, it's really a complicated topic, Julian. Um, and I think many people have written about this. Um, you know, it's very complicated in a large democracy where the government changes regularly and where the public decides who's going to be their leader and the public changes their ideas quickly also. Um, and with social media and sort of the democratization of information, suddenly the model of democracy becomes even more um, pluralistic, which can be wonderful and can promote equity, but also creates fragmentation and complexity where a country like the United States might be going down one path for a decade very happily and then suddenly new regime, new approach and whole different path. And I think that makes the United States quite complicated to be a partner in these multinational and multilateral collaborations. Right now, and the United States has ebbed and flowed. We, we have a historian here who could probably tell the story better than a public health expert, but the United States has ebbed and flowed in how it has been more isolationist and more globalist. And that really has gone back and forth since, I don't know, the beginning of the, the founding of the United States. And we've had decades and decades of intense isolationism um, but we've also had tremendous expansion and thinking and collaboration globally as well. You know, I think right now the United States is in, um, I, um, I don't know, uh, unpredictable spot, very unpredictable. We're about to have elections. We're in the middle of a COVID pandemic. Um, I don't even know how the elections are going to really happen. We've, we're going to do it by mail or in person. People are not as prepared as they need to be. And so much rides on that for how our country will engage globally. You know, my thought and prayer really is that uh, whatever shall come is one that really takes a longer term perspective on global interaction. Um, one that looks at each country for what its comparative advantage is. What is that country good at? And how does that fit with a global, um, a global sense of what our priorities are as a globe? To me, it's always interesting that we have the ability to give information now so quickly across the globe. So you would think that would help us <laughs> collaborate on ways in which we would use our comparative advantages to help the whole globe. But what we don't have is a global governance system. And um, the UN, of course, I, I'm eager to hear your experiences, deep experiences with the UN. Um, 
but right now Americans you know relationship with the UN is very tenuous and that saddens me greatly as an academic and someone who has studied the impact of the United Nations I actually recently um, published a book with colleagues on um, if we could go back to Woodrow Wilson's time of the 14 points for sort of how the globe might work together. And we had to rewrite those now. What would we rewrite? And the chapter that I was responsible for um, was discussing a global governance strategy for global health specifically. Because global health was not in Wilson's 14 points at all. But how to really establish a multinational priority setting process that has some teeth to hold countries to it. I think the SDGs, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, are really the guiding light there, but trying to figure out how to stay on that path when we have some very wealthy countries, the United States included, not always as committed um, to a stable strategy over decades to allow something like that to occur. Um, so I'm afraid I haven't got any silver bullet answer, um, but maybe a lot more um, cautions and questions and um, understanding of why we are where we are. Uh, and I think looking to countries for leadership from a informed global perspective that's critical. We have to have the right leadership uh, capacities, people, systems in place. And I'm not sure we're there yet. Thank you, President Bradley. Um, I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> President Kitaoka, um, you kindly shared the contributions from JICA, but may we hear more on the basic philosophies and approaches you have and what you envision for Japan? Well, now let me first uh, 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 provide some comments uh, to the uh, remarks of uh, President Bradley. Uh, I, I can say that I, I, I'm a little more uh, optimistic about mm -hmm. the United States because, you know, uh, I, I cannot say I'm very happy with Dr. President Trump, but still, you know, if he is really uh, leading the United States to compete with China, then you have to have a uh, better cooperation with other democratic countries, eventually. So uh, listening to the recent speech by uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, he mm -hmm. is just focusing on the importance of the idea, democracy, liberalism, and so forth, versus uh, totalitarianism. So yes. that means that the uh, U.S. also has to go back to the basic of democracy, and also U.S. has to be together with other democracies. So I hope that uh, the United States will come back to the, uh, uh, a little more to the uh, direction of international cooperation with the democratic countries. That's one. The other is that there are many, say, foundations, like uh, Bill and Melinda Foundation, with which uh, we are, JICA is also uh, doing that. Uh, some project together. We are providing the uh, polio vaccine in uh, Nigeria and also in Pakistan, which are very successful. And also the, uh, the uh, this SPJ is uh, uh, doing something together with the uh, uh, Gates you. Foundation uh, on uh, neglected uh, uh, tropical disease. Uh, therefore, the, this is your strength. You have uh, in the government is a little bit in. Uh, 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 not in a very good position, but still you have uh, many other strong yeah. private sectors and NGOs. Uh, those two reasons are the, the, the why I'm a little bit uh, uh, optimistic about that. On JICA and on Japan, you know, uh, you know, the most important thing is that Japan has been in stagnation for uh, almost three decades. After uh, 90. In early 1990s, there was a burst of a uh, uh, bubble economy. Since then, Japan's growth is very low. And then the how to uh, return to the, uh, the process of uh, development is a very important goal for Japan's economy. Without that, we cannot get enough budget from the government. That's one thing. Then uh, uh, 
uh, even if it's, it is done, uh, we can see that more, you know, uh, support from the people. Uh, we just issued a bond uh, for ticket bond. Uh, we, we have a Tokyo International Conference on African Development every three years. And then the, uh, uh, the issuing the bond was very successful last year. Uh, therefore, mm-hmm. that shows that people's support to ODA is a little bit uh, growing. Uh, that's my hope. Uh, and also, only if only we can provide a good idea, then we can have a good response from the people. That's my optimistic, uh, you know, <laughs> prediction. Well, I really、um, appreciate what you said, and I, it helps me to hear it from outside. I think you're 100% right. Our foundations, the creativity of our private sector, and its you know, generosity really is remarkable and sustains. And perhaps that will really carry us through this time. But I remain very optimistic about Japan because I think of it as a place that's able to. Um, have a top down strategy when that's what's needed, you know, and be able to say, we're all going to work in this together in a way that I'm envious of. And I think your commitment to development、um, over the decades has been I mean, to have ODA before, you know, the very beginning,、um, that, that's, that says it all what the values are. So I'm optimistic for Japan too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brother Brother. Thank you very much, President Kitaoka. We have about a little bit less than 15 minutes on the clock,、um, but、uh, we have a few questions from students in Japan today.、Uh, but before this, speaking of the next generation, what skills and abilities will be necessary to realize a society that can promote better cooperation? Well, number one is、uh, particularly among young adults. We need to develop the skills to be able to work in diverse and really inclusive ways because the world is very diverse politically, sociologically, racially, age, location, everything. And we need to develop that capacity of empathy for other cultures. That I think is just number one.、Um, I would say number two is creativity. We need people who can think outside the box, who have confidence and learn how to be resourceful with what they have to solve a problem in a new way and, and have that intellectual freedom to develop something new because we need new ideas.、Um, you know, and I guess, you know, I, I do have one other that I think is very important and it's kind of a new skill. Come back to us. But boy, the ability to communicate. And now it's communicate on social media, communicate the messaging properly. It's just, it's so much more powerful than ever before because a tweet can, you know, change, change world direction in a way. So I think、um, that's what I would say the ability to work inclusively across diverse ways. Creativity and the ability to communicate well on all media. Thank you, President Bradley.、Um, how about for Japan, President Kitaoka? My answer is very、uh, short. You know,、uh, the, any, any skill will be useful.、Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, first of all, for example, my real specialty has been history. History is useful. And、yeah. also, the political science is useful, economics is useful. Mm-hmm. Statics is useful. But on the other hand,、uh, you, you have to be open for other skills. One、mm-hmm. skill is not enough, two skills are not enough.、Uh, therefore,、uh, you have to be driven by your kind of、uh, intellectual curiosity. If you have a strong intellectual curiosity, that has driven me to, this, to today,、uh, mm-hmm. then you are very much willing to know the people in other cultures. Other civilization, then that will drive you to the world of international cooperation. Thank you for the wonderful and truly informative discussion, President Kitoka and President Bradley. We have a few questions from students in Japan interested in global development and health today. Our first question is from Ms. Sato, third year student at the Tokyo Women's University. 
what are the advantages of development aid for developed countries? She wonders if there could be an incentive for a nation to provide free cooperation, even though it would improve its status in the international community and increase its humanitarian reputation. Dr. Bradley, may we ask you first? Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking it. I guess for developed countries, the motivation um, is multifold, but often, as you have said in your question, it does have a humanitarian underpinning that people feel good about their country when they're doing good across the seas. But I also think um, the other pieces that are very motivating are trade and establishing friendships and educational collaborations that do lead to better trade. I think peace, you make friends with people, you go to school with people, um, you, you um, are donating and getting involved together, you are just less likely to go to war with each other because you're, you've got that interdependence. And um, I think that that would be uh, the other main motivation. The U.S. has also sometimes been motivated by scientific discovery that you are donating, but all of a sudden you're learning something new because you've seen it work in India or you've seen it work in Japan or you've seen it work um, in a completely new setting. Um, so I would say those would be the main advantages to a developed country. Thank you, President Bradley. Um, how about for Japan, President Kitaoka? This is a very uh, important question and because, you know, there are many people who may ask this kind of question. Uh, my answer is very simple. You know, just think about your country. The rich people are paying more taxes to support the poor people. Okay? And everyone can agree with this one. Then, how about the people beyond the border? Do you not have obligation to support the poorer people or the poorest people beyond the border? It is our obligation to support those people. That's why developed countries in OECD have uh, decided uh, to support, to provide 0.7% uh, of GDP uh, for the uh, official development assistance. This is a commitment among the rich countries. Uh, unfortunately, very few countries have have fulfilled this obligation, uh, such as the uh, Nordic countries uh, plus UK. Uh, Japan is uh, uh, only half of this, and the US is even lower. <laughs> but still, you know, uh, this idea is uh, cannot be denied. If, if you have to support the poor people in your country, why do you not have to support the poorer countries in poorer people? Thank you very much. Um, we have about just under 10 minutes, so perhaps one more question. Um, this is from Miss Kishino, a third year student from the University of Tokyo. China's uh, policies have come under fire from the international community. How can we ask uh, China to change its stance on international healthcare cooperation? President Bradley, what are your thoughts from an academic perspective? Thank you again for the question. I think it's incredibly important. I don't think we can talk about global development or global health without having China very much at the table and thinking. So if we look at China, China um, needs to grow, expand, has an enormous population that it needs to feed, um, has tremendous capacity for economic development. and. Um, I think we make a mistake when we don't collaborate, when we don't say, well, we've got to find a common ground with a resource, a global resource like that, um, to not face facts about what that is, uh, I think is very short-sighted. In many ways, when we were working on climate together, a fundamental question for China and the United States and the globe um, you know, actually China and the United States during the Obama administration really came to a place of understanding, even though it was going to take sacrifice from all sides. I think we can get back there, but it requires more recognition, especially for the U.S. and China, of each other's strengths and acceptances of that and working together. Um, rather than like one trying to beat the other, because that's just not really the globe that we live in. 
I don't know that my views are, um, they're definitely my own as an academic and um, I guess someone who's taught grand strategy for a long time. Uh, when there is a country that needs to, um, you know, get onto the global stage, it's important to accommodate that and collaborate. So hopefully you're influencing each other to prioritize um, things like human security, the environment, um, human rights, etc. cetera. Um, not an easy thing, but um, something I think we have to face. Thank you very much. Uh, President Kdauka, may we hear your thoughts on this as well? I have been uh, uh, contacting with Chinese people, Chinese scholars for many years. I have many friends in China. Uh, but actually, uh, the academic freedom, freedom speech is becoming smaller and smaller recently. And uh, they are almost uh, suffocated. Uh, the, you know, uh, in China, you cannot see Japanese news newspaper. You cannot use Google. Then uh, uh, if you use a number over 64 or 64 or whatever, uh, it is to be deleted immediately because 64 means uh, June 4th, which is a date of the Tiananmen incident. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the government is so much afraid of the people's referring to this number. And also, if there is a picture of uh, Winnie the Pooh, it is to be deleted because this is uh, Winnie the Pooh is uh, quite uh, similar to Xi Jinping, you know, <laughs> they look <laughs> like, like each other. Uh, so it is used quite often to criticize Xi Jinping. Uh, I don't like uh, uh, that this kind of uh, world in which people cannot enjoy the freedom to expand to the world. You know, uh, China is, uh, uh, you know, kindly enough to establish the big building in Ethiopia over African Union headquarters. Uh, but they, they provide, China provides the money for uh, water, electricity, and also some for uh, human personnel. But all the discussion is tapped, you know. But I don't like uh, uh, this kind of system to expand globally very much. And the one important thing is that uh, while China is uh, trying to provide more support uh, with uh, face masks, uh, protective uh, clothes, uh, all, at the same time, they are trying to expand in South China Sea, Eastern China Sea, suppressing the uh, freedom in Hong Kong, and also Uyghurs, and then uh, making, uh, showing a tough position toward India, even to Bhutan. <laughs> you know, how come uh, this can uh, go together? I, I really hope that, uh, you know, they can calm down. But, <laughs> It is uh, very difficult for such a country to be changed from outside. China can be changed only from within. Uh, occasionally, we can have some tools, uh, such kind, some kind of uh, peer pressure might work in some areas, uh, such as, you know, one thing I'm very much looking at is uh, the status of uh, Chinese lending. You know, many countries have accumulated the debt against China. And then, actually, many countries cannot pay it back to China. In this kind of situation, uh, the uh, advanced countries are accustomed to this situation. We don't like the, the right. this kind of situation, but we have a system of handling this one in the, by the name of Paris Club mm -hmm. and how to handle this issue. Whether China can enjoy to Paris Club to handle that debt issue of the developed countries. This is a test case of the Chinese goodwill. Thank you very much. Um, I wish we could go on, but uh, we're almost towards the end of the hour. Um, but may we receive closing comments uh, from both of you? Uh, President Babley, may, may we start with you? Yeah, um, and maybe I'll just start with um, just a little bit um, more in the area of um, China. I really agree with what you've just said. And I think the idea that countries change from within when they are as big and powerful as China is very consistent with the way I see it. That 
it I don't like those systems either, but how to contain it I think we could make a lot of mistakes by trying to over contain it from the outside in ways that might be impossible and might have enormous um, backfires, which I guess will bring me just to my final comment about um, what we've been talking about. And I started with interconnectedness. Um, I think particularly for the students who are listening, one thing that is, as I've learned through my career and is so important is to always be thinking of the second and third and fourth order effects of anything you do. So we are interconnected, even though we act like we are not, and we try to do so many individualistic things, but to always with every action think, and what will that trigger? And what will that trigger? And then what will happen? Really thinking ahead in an interconnected world will make us much more modest in how we intervene. And I think do less damage, unintended damage, and also allows us to maybe be a little more empathic uh, to those around the globe who are affected by one country's actions many ways down the, down the line. This can be a very positive thing because you can think if I come up with an action that triggers positive reinforcement towards something even better, that's very exciting. Um, but it can be the other way too. And I think as uh, young professionals coming of age, thinking about health and medicine globally, always thinking about the second, third, fourth order effects of everything we do is really very, is paramount um, to being a good global citizen. Thank you so much. Wonderful. President Kitaoka, may we receive your closing comments? Well, uh, when I, I look at the world as a, uh, you know, scholar in international politics, I'm not that optimistic. But still, uh, as a practitioner in a, a donor agency, I can be optimistic because the biggest reason is that I'm witnessing many excellent guys willing to come to JICA. Okay, you know, we accept uh, 30, roughly 30 young guys to JICA, plus uh, some uh, 10 uh, guys in their 30s or so. And then there's no one without experience in foreign countries. Uh, everyone has some experience, uh, such as uh, uh, they are born in foreign countries, or they have studied abroad uh, before graduating from the college, or uh, you know, they have uh, some uh, they did some internship in NGO, uh, and also they, they are just uh, uh, boys and girls, or male and female, 50-50, just 50-50. And then uh, uh, f roughly half of them are with a master's degree already, already, and then others are have, of course, diploma from uh, bachelor's degrees. Then over and over, JICA is uh, probably one of the very popular institutions in Japan. That is the evidence that people are very, with a strong uh, sense of uh, commitment to international cooperation. Uh, they, uh, having those young guys is a pleasure. And also, I think this is uh, evidence that uh, we are not going to a bad way. We are probably, possibly going to a good way. Thank you very much. Um, I hope both of you, as well as our audience, enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, SBJ will continue this series online for a year. Please find information regarding our next session on our website. And uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.